Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Science Cafe, which is sponsored by the Ohio University Research Division uh, and the local chapter of Sigma Xi, uh, which is the Scientific Honor Society. I'm Howard DeWald. I serve as the Vice President of Sigma Xi, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Uh, you probably heard Roxanne say something about a YouTube, so we'll be uploading a YouTube video. Uh, and that will be captioned and available within a short time frame, usually about 24 hours if you want to view it or if you missed it in the first place. Uh, if anyone in the room needs some extra assistance um, or access, please see Roxanne and she'll do it her best for you. Okay. Uh, for those of you who have been here, we know that the, you know that the cafes are interactive in nature. We ask you to raise your hand, ask questions, and it looks like the audience say just about everybody could get a t-shirt. So if you want a t-shirt, you know, come up with a question, raise your hand, and uh, wait for one of us to come with the microphone so we can get it recorded and, and, and proceed from there. Okay. Uh, our next cafe is scheduled for Wednesday, March 8th, so a month, right here in Baker Center again. It will be Professor Steve Owens and, excuse me, Steve Evans and Julie Owens from the Department of Psychology. Um, they are doing research in uh, intervention, research in schools, and they'll be here. So this afternoon, as you can see, we have prof the Russ Professor Jason Tremley from the Department of Mechanical Engineering in the Russ College of Engineering and Technology. He serves as the director of the Institute for Sustainable Energy and the Environment, and the talk embodied carbon and climate change. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Uh, just to give you a brief background before I jump into here. So uh, I am a chemical engineer by training, so uh, we'll start with that. I'm in the mechanical engineering department. and. I have the you know, um, pleasure to serve as director and work with some a really talented group of you know, students, faculty, and, and staff. And the work I'll be showing today has been work that I've been involved with, but um, do want to point out that this, you know, the projects and the technologies we are developing are really teamwork. And so there's going to be contributions shown here by many individuals. So first to start out with just a brief overview of the um, Institute for Sustainable Energy and Environment, or ISWE for short. So we have four faculty, myself, um, and some new um, young faculty, both Drs. Uh, Dara Mola and Al Majali, and also John Stazer from Chemical Engineering. And so we form a very um, multidisciplinary team working on technologies to address three primary areas, those being waste, um, building materials, which is what I'll talk um, quite a bit about today. Uh, the water side, where we're focused on nutrient recovery. And then energy resources, including CO2 utilization, shale gas conversion, hydrogen production, and associated technologies. And really, a lot of these elements um, come together. Our research capabilities uh, typically focus on thermocatalytic or electrochemical systems, so developing uh, chemical process technologies to address various different environmental issues. And we also have capabilities in atomic and process simulations, uh, materials R&D, but I think one of the unique aspects about our group for an academic institution is our techno-economic and life cycle analyses in combination with these others. This really gives us the capability to quantify value of the ideas that we have, whether that is in um, dollars saved, emissions prevented, or remediation of pollutants from the environment. And so just to give you a brief overview of what we've been doing in the past year, we've had a tremendous year um, we have acquired over $7 million in external funding from federal sources. So our primary partners include Department of Energy, both energy efficiency, renewable energy, fossil energy, and carbon management. And these organizations that I show you at the bottom here, these are all organizations that are involved with ISEE over the past year in these new projects. So we really serve as, you know, a front porch for the university in terms of interaction with industry. 
So primary topic today that we're going to talk about is CO2, carbon dioxide, and impacts that it has. So looking at US CO2 emissions, um, which is shown here. So when we look at CO2 emissions, we primarily look at them from a fossil energy standpoint. So our three primary energy sources within the US are petroleum, oil, natural gas, and coal. Now, this energy mix has shifted quite substantially over the past decade. Coal used to be a significant proportion, and as we have shifted our power production from primarily coal-based over to natural gas, and as our renewables are beginning to increase, we've actually been able to trend down in the amount of our CO2 emissions. And so, as you can see, we have our combinations of our CO2 emissions. Um, the electricity sector, or the power production sector, used to be our primary CO2 emitter source, but now it's in the transportation sector. And then we also have emissions from transportation, industrial, et cetera. So these are emissions that are actually emitted out into the atmosphere, or operational carbon. But what we're going to focus on today, and what we're focusing on at ISEE primarily, is looking at embodied carbon. And so this image shown here, which I borrowed from carboncure.com, presents a great graphic to kind of clearly demonstrate the difference between operational and embodied carbon. So operational carbon is that carbon that we emit from burning a fossil fuel. So we take coal, we take natural gas, we burn that, whether it's produced electricity to generate heat for a building, whatever that may be, and that CO2 is emitted to the atmosphere. Embodied carbon, on the other hand, that is the carbon that's associated with the material, and so the production and the manufacturing of that material. And it can be quite large. So for instance, concrete. So concrete is a material that we utilize in buildings every day, but it is a very carbon and energy intensive resource. We start with calcium carbonate, we burn natural gas, we heat that calcium carbonate up to produce calcium oxide, which we then use in the production of cement. So we generate CO2 from two sources, that calcium carbonate that we start with, and also the conversion and the combustion of that natural gas. And so what we are looking at is how do we reduce the embodied energy associated with building materials and looking at that across the board. Now, the reason that becomes important is looking at some of the information shown here in this slide. So if we talk about the built environment, so these are the buildings, the bridges, uh, you know, distribution systems that we work with and utilize every day. So these systems are vast. Approximately $2 trillion a year in the US are spent on our you know, built environment and the infrastructure systems. Now, if we start looking at uh, global population um, increases, the amount projected over the next 30 to 40 years, we are projected to utilize double the amount of materials that humans have utilized up to this point in time, double. So through all of human history, we're going to use twice that amount of material in the next 30 years. That is an absolutely vast amount of material. So we have to think about that from two different standpoints sustainability standpoint of where are we going to acquire this material? And number two, we need to do it in a way that is energy and environmentally friendly because the more we utilize these materials, the more impact it's going to have on our environment. And particularly if you start thinking about where we are going with our power production sector, we've made gains in reducing CO2. Renewables are becoming a greater and greater proportion of our um, portfolio, and they're going to continue to do so. So the CO2 emissions from power are going to come down, likely in transportation as well. And so the embodied carbon and energy associated with our built systems is going to increase. Now there was a paper published in Nature a couple of years ago. And so this is showing some of this information here. So looking at the amount of anthropogenic material, so man made materials that have been generated up to this point in time, that number is right now equivalent to approximately the amount of biomass that is on the earth. So if we think about that amount of human made material 
And the thought of wanting to do that in a more renewable and a more sustainable way, we can't possibly clear cut every tree and piece of grass across the world to meet these building demands. That's not going to make sense. So we have to think about how we build our buildings and the materials we utilize in buildings and construction in a different manner moving forward. So one of the innovative pieces that I think that our group at ISEE has really been leading over the past few years is really looking at alternative building materials, ways that we can utilize waste that are vastly available in new ways. And so one of the primary areas that we are looking at is mining impoundments. So this is an image of a mining impoundment located in Appalachia. So if we look at that, that impoundment material has some potentially uh, useful material. So typically impoundment waste consists of two primary components. There's mineral matter, which consists of shales and clay, and then there's that waste carbon, so that coal content fine material that is part of the process which has been deposited in these impoundments. Now these impoundments are vast, right? So when we think about impoundments, and think about the Hoover Dam, right? The Hoover Dam is a massive human-made dam and object. These impoundments in Appalachia are some of the largest human-made structures in the world. They are larger than the Hoover Dam. So these waste materials are widely available in Appalachia, Illinois basins, Powder River Basin, et cetera. And estimates are that there are four billion tons of waste carbon material sitting in these impoundments. So one of the key questions that I have been posing is, can we take this waste carbon material and can we convert that into a building material that sequesters that carbon? So if we're taking this material, we've already expended the energy to mine, can we take that and convert it into a building material that sequesters that carbon? Now, in order to do that successfully, there are three primary points that we need to be able to hit. Number one, we need to develop materials that have a lower price point than the currently available materials. Number two, it's going to have to be, have equivalent or better performance. So this needs to be a safe, better performing material to utilize in whatever application of interest. And number three, it's going to need to have a better environmental profile, meaning it's going to need lower embodied and uh, carbon intensity in comparison to the existing material. Now, before I go down the details, I wanna talk about what we've done here just in, in general. And this is work that I am really proud of. I'm proud of the work that our team has done. Um, so we had a project with USDOE wrapped up a few months ago and working with two different partners, Console Energy and Western PA and Engineer Profiles, which is a manufacturer in Columbus, Ohio. Now, in October of 2019, so this is a small material sample. So we were developing these carbon composite materials in our lab, and this was the scale that we were at in October 2019. And as you can see here in this timeline, right, so there's where we started, we started scaling this with our industry partners. Now, if you notice the timeline here, in January of 20, right, something took place in March of 20. But because we were working with our industry partners, we were able to scale this up. So we were able to take that material scale it using a commercial facility and actually develop a commercial material. So this is an example, this is a prototype of decking board that we've made. So this is made of 100% waste material, utilizing waste carbon from an impoundment here in Appalachia and recycled plastics. Should I pass that around? Yeah, absolutely. So, at the end of this project last year, through that scaling and development, we actually went and completed a demonstration. So, this is showing some of my partners um, with Engineer Profiles and Console Energy standing on a deck made of material that we developed here at Ohio University and successfully scaled. So, 
This was completed at a facility near Washington, D.C. And so we hired independent contractors, they built decks, we received feedback, and we've gone through complete ASTM testing to demonstrate that this material is safe. So we're gonna talk about this development timeline in more detail. So key pieces, right? So we need a material that is lower cost, is safe, and has better environmental performance. So we're gonna talk about the performance and the safety aspect first. So we tested a host of commercial decking materials to start out with, to have an understanding where they're at. So, you know, materials that are out there today, you know, there's some examples here if anybody wants to see them. And so we test those to give us an idea of where the current performance is at. And so then we test our materials. So we've developed these carbon uh, composite materials with formulations shown both here using recovered materials, bitumens from Appalachia, and then PRB materials that were recovered in the western US. And so we've looked at those properties. And so some of the key pieces we were able to show is that we have flexural strength and flexural modulus that are either equivalent or slightly better than the commercial materials. So that's important from two key aspects, from a safety factor. We have safety factors ranging from 34 to 46. So that means if you go and build a deck with this material, this is going to be a safe material that is going to provide plenty of stability. Number two, on the flexure strength, this is a, it's going to have less um, flexure and warping. And so this is important from the standpoint of thinking about when you build a structure and you have cross members, this means we can gain greater uh, spacing between those cross members, and so we can reduce cost in the construction as well. So two key positive factors that we found with our material. Jason, yes. Jason, we've got a question from your online audience. They want to know when you're going to place the combo floor. <laughs> I'm not kidding, they asked. Hopefully next year. Okay. So, if I'm coming to you, you know, one of the key concerns that potentially you know, you're making this material from waste carbon, you know, recovered coal resources is, how is it going to perform from a fire performance, right? We burn coal to produce power. So we had to go through extensive testing to evaluate that. Now, the way, this, the way you evaluate the fire properties for building materials typically is from what's called a E84 test. And so it uses what is called a Steiner tunnel here. So this is about 20 foot long uh, tunnel and you have about a two foot wide section of your material that sits in the top of that tunnel and then you hit it with natural gas flame. So you bombard it with very intense heat and fire and evaluate two different things. Number one, how far that flame propagates down the Steiner tunnel itself. So you can see, you can measure how far it propagates. And number two, you can evaluate the smoke that's generated by that material. And so that information is used to give it a classification here. So A, B, or C. So to go into building applications, it has to leap to at least be C, and then depending upon the area, they may require an A classification. So such as California, where you have wildfire issues, they require an A rating. So here's a comparison of our material with commercially available materials here. So some important pieces that we found. What we ended up finding was the waste carbon-based material actually possesses superior flammability properties in comparison to commercial material. So this is material that burns slower with less heat. So we look at some material, some properties here. So ignition time, this is how long it took for it to catch fire. Nearly twice the amount of time. How far that flame front advanced down the tunnel. It is nearly half of what the existing material is. The max temperature is half of the uh, existing material. There's no falling ash. So this means this is a safer material. It has far less flammability. And the reason why is associated with those waste carbon prop, uh, properties. So that material, when it burns because of the carbon structures in there, 
it is, has caking properties, and so it actually foams, and that foaming action that happens in the material extinguishes that flame. And so with this base material, we achieved a class B rating, but our flame spread index was a 26. So we are right on the verge of class A, and with some changes, knowing what we know now, we can go in and we can engineer that formulation to bump us up to a class A rating um, should it be necessary for the building application. Okay, so we have a material that meets you know, uh, structural properties, physical properties. We have a material that's safe from a flammability standpoint. So the next case is, is this cost effective? Can we produce a product that's going to save money for the end consumer. So the way that we assess this is by conducting a, what's called a techno-economic analysis or a TEA. And so this is a cost model. Now one of the advantages here is that working with the partners that we have, they manufacture these types of materials. So we were able to acquire very detailed and very accurate information to go into our assessments. And so the way that we did this is looking at um, you know, some evaluations here, so some parameters. So looking at a facility that would have, say, 10 lines manufacturing this material at 12 and a half tons per hour um, with operating. And so this facility would operate for 20 years and would employ 220 individuals. And so there's a couple of different items when you think about manufacturing a product and then how that product is distributed. So typically it goes through two different steps. So you manufacture the product, that product is then sold to the distributor, then it goes to an end point of sale, typically you know, Lowe's, Home Depot, et cetera. So there's two different markups on it. So when we looked at our material, so looking at a price in linear foot, our manufacturing cost is around 73 cents per linear foot, and then including two 40% markups, we estimated a cost of $1.29 per foot. We also did a baseline costing for the existing material just to give us, you know, try to have as close of an apples to apples comparison as possible. And we're at $1.50. So where it really becomes interesting is when we start looking at our comparison with actual costs that are out in the market. So we have our cost estimate of $1.29. So this is what it would cost the consumer to go to Lowe's pick up a piece of this material and utilize that in their installation. So if we're looking at the cost of existing materials, similar to these on the, at the front here, we have significant cost savings. So one of the pieces that I will mark upon here is that, you know, say for these two materials here, these are what we consider premium type materials in their performance and their look. And so they're gonna have a cost of $5 or more. The material that we're generating that's passing around there has those same premium properties or slightly better, but a cost of $1.29. So significant cost savings. Now, when we first started developing this technology, we were looking at can we develop something that can you know, take, is there a share of the composite decking market that we could acquire? Well, that's a $2 billion a year market in the US. But now what we're able to do is looking at $1.29, we're now approaching the cost of pressure-treated lumber. Pressure-treated lumber is a 20 to $30 billion a year market in the US. So through the engineering and the development and the synergies of these materials, we've been able to significantly squeeze and reduce the cost of our materials to the point now where we can have nearly direct competition with a pressure-treated product. All right, so we've got cost advantages. Next key question is where do we stand in terms of environmental performance? So to evaluate environmental performance, we conduct what are called life cycle analyses. So these are similar to those TEAs that I just mentioned, but instead of looking at from a cost aspect, we're looking at from a uh, resource aspect. So in terms of the resources that we utilize and how much carbon and energy. So this is estimating the embodied carbon and the energy associated with our materials. And so when we did this, we did this from a cradle to gate analysis standpoint. And so what that means is this is taking in estimates of all the resources that we're utilizing to produce our product 
So whether that be the waste coal, the plastics, the electricity, the water, et cetera, accounting for all of that. And then, so looking at that from four different standpoints, so the resource extraction, so for the existing material, this is cutting down that tree. Uh, transportation, so trucking it, and then at the sawmill, and then we have our manufacturing as well. On our waste carbon material, and to be as conservative as possible, we looked at from a newly mined material. So rather than a waste material that's sitting out in the field already, we put more burden on our carbon material from making a newly mined material. So having to take into account all of the energy and emissions associated with that. And then conveying that material and then the preparation and then manufacturing. So doing that in a um, equivalent manner to look at differences between them. All right, so this is showing the comparison between these. So on the left, we have our specific energy demand. This is our embodied energy associated with our materials, shown as megajoules per ton of composite. And then we have our emissions, so our CO2 emissions per ton of composite. So our overall sum values are here. So what we showed from our analyses is that utilizing this waste-based material, which has better cost performance and better physical performance is that it actually has a better environmental performance as well. Approximately 30% reduction in the energy and the CO2 emissions associated with it. So how does that compare in terms of pressure treated lumber? Well, Trex, right, which is one of the potential products that we're competing with, they uh, published a sustainability report I think about a year ago, maybe two years ago, and they are claiming that their material is 60%, has 60% lower carbon and embodied energy associated in comparison to pressure treated lumber. And where pressure treated lumber and the emissions and every, all the energy associated really comes about is all of the treatments that you have to do, right? So you have to stain, varnish, seal that material on a regular basis. When you start looking at all of the energy that goes into producing those chemicals, that pressure treated lumber footprint becomes very large. And so we believe that we can provide even a greater reduction in carbon and energy utilizing these waste-based materials. Jason, yes. can you go back uh, a slide? You have another question from your online audience. Uh, people in the room, feel free to ask questions as well. Um, just a clarification. So for the resource extraction, is that uh, assuming that you have to extract the coal or that it's already been extracted? That's the first part of the question. And then the second part of the question is, is there actually any government incentive for using your waste material that you did not take into account? So number one, our, so when we build in the resource extraction, we place the energy required to extract, to actually mine that coal. So this is as heavily burdened as possible. If we were looking at this from a legacy impoundment, that it would lower these numbers. So we looked at this from a conservative standpoint of increasing the numbers as much as possible. From the incentive standpoint, right now there's not a, an incentive. So right there, are, the government has incentives right now for carbon utilization. So if you can pull either CO2 out of the atmosphere or utilize CO2 that would otherwise be emitted to produce a useful product, there is a, an incentive that they will place on that carbon. That does not exist now but there are, that is a discussion that's starting to come up is can we put place incentives that would actually create markets to go remediate such you know, impoundments and legacy waste. Thank you. All right, so that's what we've done with our composite materials um, from the standpoint of this is the first line of you know, items that we're looking at. So to give you some other ideas, you know, though working with our partners, right? So this is a, has a wide range of applications. So one is piping, right? So if you think about plastic piping, in particular, you know, sewage and drainage pipe, that is a massive market that utilizes a significant amount of material. So if you look at the amount of plastics used, say, in decking, 
versus what's used in piping, that piping market segment uses 10, 20, 30 times more plastic a year. So it's a much bigger opportunity. Now, one of the reasons that we're able to reduce embodied energy emissions is because with the synergies of these materials, we're able to reduce the amount of plastic used in these end items. So less plastic usage, less energy emissions. And so this is an example of first prototype you know, piping uh, materials that we are making. So we've, we've tested that, you know, and it shows great promise of meeting all the ASTM specification for um, drainage pipe. Um, thinking about other applications, so windows, so what um, fenestration um, or doorways, et cetera. So this is just you know another example of material of a complicated profile. So that could be a door frame, a window frame, et cetera. So we're looking at this and looking at it from other applications. Now, as we looked at this material and we looked at this technology, we've decided to kind of, where can we utilize this and where can we pivot this technology? So additive manufacturing has been uh, an area of key interest to us. So we've looked at this in developing these materials and, and pivoting them over to um, FDM or FGF. So basically um, either developing filaments here or having a pelletized material that we 3D print. And so we've seen tremendous uh, development you know, quickly in this area. We've seen synergies with the FDM materials, and so we can produce a material that has better, um, better properties. But more importantly, one of the pieces that we have seen is this allows us to actually use uh, polyethylene as a printing material. So polyethylene alone does not work well. It warps when you try to 3D print it. We have plentiful waste polyethylene, but we can't use it in these applications. With the formulations we've developed, we can actually print these materials and significantly reduce warping. So the way that, that means now is that we have a material with a significant mass quantity that's available that allows us to use in large applications. So tooling's one example. Um, you know, here at the bottom right, this is just showing you know, a little item that we've 3D printed just to demonstrate capability that you can develop shapes. But where we ultimately like to go and where we are targeting is home construction. So my thought is, you know, if we're thinking about this, and especially if you think about all of the growth that's going to happen in central Ohio over the next couple of decades, um, we already have challenges with affordable housing. That's only going to grow. And if you think about going back, the amount of materials we need for building houses, my thought and where I'd like to go is, if we, again, we can take these waste carbon materials, we combine that with recycled plastics that we can now enable for construction, and we can additively manufacture homes using these materials and do it in a modular way. We could do it you know, in a facility, say, in Athens, and then those components can be shipped out to you know, someplace near Columbus and then assembled into a home. So we can significantly reduce cost of home construction. Another piece related in this area is graphite manufacturing. So we're thinking about transportation and lithium ion batteries that are going to be necessary to achieve electrification of our transportation sector. Um, this is a challenge from a supply chain standpoint. It's also a security challenge. So when you think about lithium ion batteries, we talk about the metals, the cobalt, nickel, lithium that are needed, and those are absolutely true. But graphite is an important component of lithium ion batteries. We do not have um, any substantial natural graphite mines in the US. So virtually all of our graphite is sourced outside of the US. So this ends up being a energy security standpoint if we cannot acquire the materials we need to generate those renewable energy um, components that we need. And so what we're also looking at is taking these waste carbon materials and converting them into graphite. So uh, my colleague, John Staser, is working on the battery piece. We're focused on taking that waste carbon, converting it into 
uh, into graphite, placing these in lithium ion batteries. And we all, through this project, we have a partnership with General Motors. And so they're looking at this, you know, from a supply chain standpoint, can we utilize, you know, waste carbon resources from Appalachia to meet their demands? Yes. Um, do you know how long lasting or durable these new materials are? Great question. Uh, I didn't include the information here, but we have done those tests. So to give you an idea of when we've done a comparison of say that board that's somewhere out there in the audience and say these boards that are up here, our material has better oxidation resistance so it will not oxidize anywhere near as readily as the existing material so it will actually have a much longer lifetime out in the field so it's much greater it, res it resists UV and thermal oxidation. And where that comes down to is in those waste carbon materials. So they have um, some phenolic compound nature to them, and they also have sulfur. And those serve as primary and secondary antioxidants, which are naturally in those materials and help subside oxidation naturally for that product. So they will last longer. Well, I should say, should last longer, right? These are tests. And you can't really prove that out until they're actually out in the field. But from a property standpoint, they should have longer performance. Just a quick question. And now that you mentioned lithium, that's becoming a nightmare because what happens when at the end of the life? So what happens when this has reached its final point? Absolutely. So two different things on, 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 on disposal. Number one, we've done testing on these to say, can you safely dispose of them, right, to put them in a landfill, though that's not the ideal situation. But we've done uh, method, EPA method 1311, completely safe material to dispose of. But one of the key advantages of using that waste carbon material in comparison to the wood-based composites right now is that waste carbon is a much more thermally stable material. So what that means is we can more readily recycle it. So to separate the plastic from the filler material, you have to increase temperature and that allows you to separate them. The problem with those wood-based materials is the temperature that you need to, for separation, cause the production of bio-oils. Those bio-oils make that plastic, you will not be able to reutilize it again. So these WPCs, the existing on the market, really have one or two disposal methods. Either they're going to go to landfill or they're going to be incinerated. For the waste carbon materials, we actually have a much greater opportunity to actually recycle those materials and put them back into a circular economy. And I want to point out some work that our my colleagues are doing here. So this is... Um, from Dr. Drabold and Chinanzo. And so one of the things that we're looking at is this graphization is in their molecular dynamics simulation is showing the applicability here, right? So starting out with this waste carbon, this coal molecule, and with the thermal processing, right? So you see it goes from this jumble and naturally forms planes, right? So that is the formation of graphite, right? Those graphene sheets in parallel to one another. So we're utilizing both experimental uh, capabilities, but also molecular dynamic capabilities to look at developing these materials for future opportunities. All right, so I'm going to take a pivot off of, yes? Uh, real quick question. How sensitive are these materials to the quality of your input? These impoundments were waste. There's, is there uniformity in them? So, yes and no. So, number one, different impoundments will have some different characteristics. Um, but number two, these impoundments are absolute, they're, they're massive. So, you could set up a manufacturing facility and utilize that one impoundment for maybe a decade or two, depending on upon your operation. Number two, there's several companies now that have developed refining technology that actually can take that material and they refine it so you can get a pure carbon material and then your mineral material. The mineral material is actually going to agricultural applications. It actually can be a soil amendment um, and works quite well. 
And so there's technology out there already commercially available that allow, would allow us to go in and, you know, if this impoundment has 50% waste carbon, this impoundment has 40%, it wouldn't change us because we can refine to a pure carbon product that we're using. All right, so I'm gonna pivot a little bit here. We're still staying on um, embodied carbon, but looking at it from a different standpoint. So nutrient recovery, right? So in the past 10 years, we've run into issues with eutrophication, nutrient pollution in our waterways, right? So nitrogen and phosphorus causing algal blooms, whether it's in Lake Erie, we even had algal blooms in the Ohio River in a moving body of water. So that's problematic from the impact that it has on our environment and our population. Number two, that nitrogen and phosphorus, those are highly energy and intensive materials, require a lot of energy and resources to make them, right? Because they're fertilizers. And so what we've been focusing on at ISWE is developing technologies that allow us to actually go in and capture those nutrients so we can repurpose them, so we can recapture them reducing eutrophication and pollution of the environment, but then also reutilize them, so reducing the amount of new fertilizer production. And where this is particularly important is from the phosphorus supply chain, right? So nitrogen, we fix nitrogen from the air. So thanks to the Haber-Bosch process, we have almost limitless nitrogen that we can fix. Phosphorus is a totally different story. It is a finite resource. And the vast majority of it lies in Morocco. So there are supply chain and there's food uh, you know, security issues around that chain should it ever be disrupted. So our point is rather than we can reduce the amount that we have to pull out if we just reutilize the materials that we're already wasting. So we've been looking at developing electrochemical technology that allows us to recover both the phosphorus and the nitrogen species into a reusable fertilizer material. And so we initially started looking at this from an animal waste, so it was a concentrated animal feeding operation, so treating the wastewater that they have in their lagoons, but recently also pivoted this over into wastewater treatment facilities as well. And so we've done modeling here that tells us, shows us the ability to acquire these materials and tells us you know, the operational parameters that we need to run but we've also looked at them from a cost standpoint. And so when you're looking at this in comparison to existing fertilizers, there's actually potential cost advantages here, not just to go and recover from an environmental standpoint, but also from a supply chain uh, cost reduction as well. So this is a, a new area that we are, are uh, pushing forward within the group. Now, Another related technology is carbon utilization. So this is a brand new project. It was announced last week by the US Department of Energy. Um, so we're looking at the ability to utilize, again, some electrochemical technology. So taking green energy as the power input, so low carbon energy, and utilizing produced water. So produced water is waste generated by oil, gas, uh, operations, we generate 20 to 25 billion barrel, 25, 20 to 25 billion barrels of this waste material a year in the U.S. alone. It is the single largest waste stream by volume across the world. Now that material is laden with magnesium and calcium. And so what we're interested in doing is utilizing that waste material with green energy and CO2, whether that's coming from a point source you know, that could be, say, flue gas coming from the Laos heating plant, or it could be CO2 that's just out in the atmosphere, and so direct air carbon capture. And so we've shown that we can take these materials and we can produce calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonates. And so where this is utilized, then, two different areas, engineered composites, which I've been talking about, but kind of the bigger application is in cement. So I've, I've you know, earlier in the talk, talking about the carbon and the energy intensity of cement, this is a way we can potentially green cement while remediating waste material. So this is a new uh, $2.5 million project we received, so we're excited we're gonna start kicking this off in the next few months. So 
This is a quick summary. There is, I, I can't tell you the number of hours and time spent by all the individuals on our team. So these are the undergraduate and graduate student members of our team. Uh, I am absolutely um, lucky to work with this team. Talented, dedicated, you know, in developing these technologies and have made significant contributions. And so there's likely some individuals here that I have missed to provide here, not intentional. Um, but as I mentioned, for me, developing technologies and tackling these challenges require the development of a diverse team. So diversity in skill set, background, and thought. And through that diversity, and thinking really allows you to develop ideas and develop them quickly to really tackle these challenges. And then uh, our professional staff at ISEE and then also the faculty that I work with here across campus. So just a brief summary you know, of what we've talked about. So we're looking at trying to tackle embodied carbon, so the amount of energy and carbon that goes into making the materials that we utilize every day, primarily in the built environment. We've successfully developed, say, the first prototype or the first um, you know, idea to demonstrate the viability of it with the composite decking material. We've demonstrated that it meets the uh, cost necessary, it's a lower cost material, it performs better, it is a safe material, and it also has a better environmental uh, performance than the existing. Uh, we have a robust R&D pipeline at ISEE, uh, so we're always interested in bringing new students on board across campus, uh, so if anybody here is interested in joining us, please, I'll have my contact information next, so please just reach out to me and we're happy to have a conversation. And with that, open up to any questions. So, so it looks like to me you can build an entire house because you've got the structure for the walls, you've got the plumbing, you've got the wiring. Uh, I suppose the decking can become a roof. What, what can't you do besides maybe the glass? Electric. <laughs> Electric. Though I will say though, um, one, so, you know, the electrical wiring, but uh, one of our faculty members is working on developing uh, wiring, utilizing carbon inputs that will actually increase its conductivity, so less metal that would be needed. But, you know, essentially what we're really interested in is can we build a carbon house? So um, I'm wondering what you see the barriers are for the scaling up of this in, in, because there must be some, and you mentioned cost a little bit, but you know, if, it, you know, if, it, if it really, what's preventing it from taking further steps or bigger steps? I think you know, one of the biggest pieces around this likely is going to be marketing, right? So, you know, getting, you know, overcoming potential barriers from a um, mental standpoint of somebody willing to utilize this material because it's made from, you know, legacy mining waste. That, you know, working with commercial partners, that's, that's one of the primary pieces. Um, there's always the cost. So we have, we have, uh, we have cost advantages which are extremely um, attractive but there's also, you know, so thinking about building a new manufacturing facility, you know, we're talking, this is a $100 million investment. So there's always that piece of, you know, a new market or a going in competition into an existing market with that level of investment needed. So that risk tolerance that's there. Just throwing it out there, but you do know that we have the shales, uh, the Shea Sales Center here, one mm -hmm. of the best marketing centers in the U.S.? <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and this is one of the pieces. So the commercial teams are working, you know, they, they're re looking at marketing. And from, 
this is the part that I find entertaining, right? So there's the engineers sitting at the table and we're coming up with ideas that we think are cool names for you know, the decking material. And then the marketing people are like, no, just. Stick to your lane. St yeah. Okay. Um, could you please tell us about your educational background? I think you missed something in oh, sure. your intro. <laughs> so, I, so I am a Bobcat. I am Bobcat through and through. So I received my uh, bachelor's degree in chemical engineering here from Ohio University. My graduate degree is also from Ohio University, though I had a really different, I had a very different graduate experience. So my PhD is from Ohio University, but the opportunity it provided was it allowed me to obtain a fellowship with the U.S. Department of Energy. So I worked at U.S. DOE, National Energy Technology Lab, while I was in grad school. It was a phenomenal experience. And my goal here has been to recreate that experience that I had here on campus so that you don't have to go to a national lab to work on these types of technologies. And then number two, that opportunity led me to RTI International and Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. If you're not familiar with RTI, you may be familiar with Battelle and Columbus. So RTI and Battelle kind of go, one will be slightly larger than the other depending upon the year. And they do, a, they do research with a B, a billion dollar you know, research budget a year. And so that experience really helped me develop understanding of you know, how, do we, how do we develop material, how do we take those fundamentals or how do we develop an idea and how do we translate that into a product that can ultimately go out and be used by society. Um, so those two experiences there and then was recruited back here to Ohio University and I've been here since 2011. But my graduate experience was very transformational I believe that wouldn't have been possible without Ohio University. And my point is I want to recreate that for students that are choosing to pursue grad school here. Another question came up as I was thinking about the material waste. I know that there can be radiological aspects of some of this waste. Is that part of anything that your organization is looking at? We have, so we have looked at that through um, they're various different, you know, we've looked at leaching materials. So at least for the materials that we have worked with, radiological is not an issue, at least for these carbon-based materials. Now that new project that I mentioned, the CO2 utilization and reutilizing oil gas waste, that's going to be an interesting aspect that we're going to, that it's a key component we're going to be focusing on early. Okay, another commercial, Edwards Accelerator Lab, nuclear <laughs> physics. <laughs> um, I'm gonna step in here for a moment. You know, Jason, do you remember when we met way back when you were an undergraduate um, and then a, a graduate student? Um, just wanna do a little bit of bragging about the Center and Institute. If anybody is interested in this type of research, it's a really welcoming environment. Jason genuinely means that he wants to involve students. Also community members. I think you've been mm -hmm. great about community outreach, yep. and so we really wanted to thank you for doing the Science Cafe. We do have a few minutes. Does anybody have uh, a question that they want to ask before and, we wrap up? And to that point, ISE is not me. It, it is a team of researchers, you know, so. Yeah. You know, Dr. Daramola, Alma Jolly, and Stazer, and myself, and we also work with others in physics and, and across campus. So, any other questions? All right, then let's take the opportunity to thank Dr. Trembling. <laughs> <laughs>